introduce Dr. Kojo Corte. Dr. Kojo Corte is the president of the Mineral County Community College. And uh, <laughs> I asked his secretary to give me some of his affiliations because most of us put a few of those behind our name, right? He had 22. <laughs> So I'm sorry, Dr. Kojo, I did not list them for everyone here today. Um, so Dr. Kojo will be our Master of Ceremonies, and he is ready to progress with the program. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Good evening. Who's excited to be here? Thank you. The Breakfast Club. Did you bring breakfast with you? <laughs> anyway, I, I couldn't help it. I, I had to. Uh, but uh, it's, it's good to be here this evening. My job this evening is to move the program along. Right? You're here to see art and, and, and be involved in art. And, of course, honor Robert S. Duncanson, who was a great artist. Not just a black artist, but a great artist. And, and so, you know, with that, but... Being in here, this is a new facility. It's just been renovated. Who's been here before? Okay, very good. And Scott, Scott Bentley, who's the superintendent, was the person, I think, making the announcements. And uh, we have a facility on campus at the college that's much larger than this, but we don't allow food in there. So if anybody's got pull at the college, Matt, Matt and Trustee, uh, maybe we can let, let food into the Meyer Theater. Okay, allow food in the Meyer Theater, make it a much more friendly place, right? So, but one introduction, I do have a board member here as the president of the college. I, I am governed by a board. And Florence Buchanan is here. Stand up, Florence. <laughs> Florence is also the head of CREE, the Coalition for Racial Equality, Equity, and Diversity, which is a coalition that we formed here in Monroe County to bring about reconciliation and conversations. And we have a conversation every month. And this month, next week, is going to be on CRT. Who's heard about CRT? <coughs> Critical race theory. What is it and what is it not? But that's not what this is about this evening. So let me move on with the program. So the Robert S. Duncanson Society began as a Rotary Committee last year. I was president of the local Rotary. And uh, so Pat Barley, where's Pat? Stage, my left, your right. Uh, came to Rotary and said, you know, that's a black artist, that's black artist, Robert S. Duncanson, who lived here in Monroe and was the best, the, the best landscape artist that, that, that in the 19th century. And many of us, of course, knew nothing about him. And so then we formed a committee, a Rotary committee, to further investigate. And then, uh, before you knew it, um, Pat Raleigh ran with it, he bulldogged it. And that's why we're, we are here today. There are others, of course, who've worked on this, right, uh, through, uh, throughout the, the, this time period. But uh, the NAACP and William Parker, who was at the door there, president of the local NAACP, um, got involved with it. The uh, 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 Monroe Art League and, and several others got involved in, in, in this process. And that's why we are where we are today. Um, in terms of Rotary, I wouldn't be a good Rotarian. Any Rotarians in here? Uh, thank you, Bill Saul. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and so, uh, we provide service to others. Service to others. Promote, promote integrity and in advanced world understanding, goodwill, and peace through our fellowship of business, professional, and community leaders. And that's what Rotary does. And that's why Rotary backed this. And so with that said, my job is to move the program along, and I know there are people in here who say, move along, fella, just move along. And um, so with that, I am going to introduce uh, Pat Barley, who's going to come up and speak for a few minutes about how we got to where we are with playing our artists and some of the other things that we've been doing. So thank you. Come on, Pat. That way I can talk a lot with you. Uh, Robert Duncanson, this is my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes ever. I have no color on my brain, all I have on my brain is paint. When he put it to the canvas, it was blank. 
where he put color in it, became art. So um, he's, uh, I, I knew very little about it. Florence, raise your hand again. Florence wrote an article in the Road News last year, last January, I believe it was, or February, about Robert Selden Duncanson. I read that article and I said, how come I don't know about him? Because I'm a plein air painter. I'm a landscape painter. How did I not know about this guy? So we started looking, I started doing some uh, uh, research on him. And we have a very short list of accomplishments by Robert Sultan Ducks in his time on Earth. For the Detroit Breakfast Club, he was the first artist of any color to have a one-man show in Detroit. The first one, the very first one, in 1848, I believe. He was born in Fayette, New York, which is in Seneca County, the Finger Lakes region. Well, in the Finger Lakes region, this year is the entire year. It's Robert Selton Douglas of the year. They celebrate the entire year. He was born in 1821. No one knows what day it was, but it was uh, 1821. And his family were uh, free African Americans, and uh, they were skilled in carpentry and housemaking. Well, when he was 10, they moved to Monroe. And Monroe back then was called the thriving metropolis of Monroe. <laughs> Have you been in Monroe? <laughs> That's what they call it, the thriving metropolis of Monroe. And he took up the family trade, trade, which was house painting. So a lot of the houses that are being painted, that were painted from the 1800s, 1820s, 1830s, were probably painted by uh, Duncanson's. Now, Bill Saul is working on a pro pro uh, house that was built in, what year was that built? 22. 1822. Probably painted that house, the Johnson Feeney House, which is down in Monroe. So it could have been Douglas who painted that house. Uh, and then he uh, started his own company when he was 19 years old, and that lasted about a year. But he wanted to become a landscape artist. Well, that wasn't anything here in Monroe to do that. So he went to Cincinnati. Cincinnati was known as the Athens of the Midwest. There's a lot of uh, rich people lived in, in Cincinnati, and there were several art schools in Cincinnati. Being a black African American, he went down there, he couldn't go to any one of those art schools. But a lot of the abolitionists were also artists. So they would go to school and then they would come back and they would teach the black artists how to paint. He became one of them. So he never really had any formal training as a painter. Um, we started doing fine arts, still like drawings and portraits. And uh, this he painted in the mid 1820s. He just had gotten down there in 18, 1841. And in one year, two years, he started painting like this. Next one. He did a portrait of Freeman Carey in 1856. That's in the Smithsonian Museum. He did the vulture and his prey. It's in the Smithsonian Museum. To make ends meet, he essentially became an itinerant artist, and he would travel from town to town painting for people who would pay him to do their uh, portraits. So there's a lot of paintings of our Robert Sullivan Duncanson sitting on people's walls. Yeah. And he never signed a lot of them. <laughs> so you never know. Um, but he went to, uh, when he was in Cincinnati, he was commissioned by anti-slavery activist Charles Avery. Avery was a Methodist minister, but he was also uh, an investor in mines. So he painted, he asked him to go out and paint the cliff mines which is in the UP. So in Cincinnati, there are no rains, trains, or automobiles. No train, no. How do you get there from Cincinnati to the Keweenaw Peninsula? If you're from Michigan, we talk like this, right? Yeah. So it's up here from Cincinnati. And how he got there, we don't know. But uh, he got up there and he painted the cliff mine and became famous for that painting that paint. Next. And this is another, it's in the Smithsonian. American's Forgotten Landscape Artists. Next, Black Long, which is also in the Smithsonian. Next one, Landscape of the Rainbow. Anybody seen this before? Last year, Joe Biden picked this painting to be the president for the inauguration. This is, Joe, this is uh, Robert Sullivan Duncanson. And because and during the ceremony, he said, there our determined democracy forged a more perfect union. So this, and we've seen this picture in the Smithsonian, and it's a beautiful painting. It's huge, it's, it's big. Next, Heart of the Andes. 
It's another one of his paintings. He painted just before he died. But thinking that's probably going to be in the art show when he got sick. It's now in the Kalamazoo Museum of Art. It's good art. Okay. This is Cincinnati coming to Kentucky. He had a lot of criticism. They said that he didn't paint enough about abolitionism. This is about abolition. He worked in Cincinnati, which is across the river here. This is from Covington, Kentucky, which was a slave state. On this side, you can see the slaves working in the fields, and the white owners sitting over here having a picnic. He was making a statement in that painting. So he was uh, pretty much an abolitionist. Next. In the mid-1860s, he, he was getting uh, paintings. Remember, he started 1840, okay? In the 1860s, he was getting $15,000 a painting. $15,000 in current money is $400,000 per painting with no training. Okay? So anybody can paint. Um, he, wrote, he did a painting. He's also an, an avid reader. And he read a lot of poetry. So he got to meet Alfred Lord Tennyson on the Isle of Wight. He brought his most celebrated painting was The Land of the Lotus Eaters, which was based on a poem by Lord Tennyson. And he said, and Lord Tennyson said when he saw this, your landscape is a land in which one loves to wander and linger. That's one thing about, Dennis, about Duncan's paintings. When you stand in front of it, you can stand there for a long time. Because it would take 18 months to do one painting. So when you looked at it, the detail was amazing. Just amazing. So he was called by the uh, Smithsonian calls him the greatest landscape artist of the West in the 19th century. Pretty good accolade. He invented a unique place for himself that no other African American had attained at the time. And um, they had a special uh, presentation in uh, the early 2010s, in the exhibit admit in 2012, but it was at the uh, uh, Smithsonian Museum of Art, Art Museum. Next. These paintings right here are in the Taft Museum in Cincinnati. When you walk into the Taft Museum, this is what you see. These are all Duncanson's paintings. And the owner of that was a rich abolitionist. And he commissioned him to do the paintings for his home, for his, for his mansion. The paintings of this mansion is what allowed him to travel through Europe in the 1860s, because he paid for all that. Interesting fact about these, they were covered with wallpaper. Wow. But with, but also, they afterwards after moved in after the uh, uh, original owner. And they were uncovered in the 1830, uh, 1930s. They found these. This is on plaster. This is not on canvas. He painted on plaster. So when you walk into this museum, it's a kind of big museum. It's a tall ceilings, and uh, the, the detail is amazing. It took him several years to paint these. Next. We thought we were the uh, uh, Robert Selden Douglas Society. Well, we're the second one. The first one was in Cincinnati. <laughs> And uh, we didn't know that until after we started doing this. And it came about in uh, 1986. And every year since then, they had an artist in residence. This young lady, uh, Johnny Dawkins, is a writer and performance artist. She's a poet. And she is this, this year, 2022, uh, artist in residence. She'll be uh, there for 13 days, I believe, at the Taft Museum. And uh, we have a program coming up on April 19th. So I'm going to contact the Taffy CMC. We borrow her for one day, <laughs> just for a day. But the interesting thing about the Douglas Society, their artist residence, is that their uh, program is not just about visual arts. It's writing. It's about performance, dance. We've had some uh, artists in residence who are dancers. Okay. And um, next. Okay. Next. Eric Capel, I painted with him in the Adirondacks. He's a young guy, he's in his 40s. And his paintings are phenomenal. This painting is about nine feet long and about six feet high. Next. Bob Parrish, Michigan plein air painter. Lives up in uh, Plymouth, I believe. And he's come to a family of four of his, his, his siblings and four of them, they're all painters. And they're all brilliant painters. Next. 
Greg Summers. Greg Summers is interesting. I, saw, I met him uh, in the Adirondack and saw this guy standing beside a lake. He was painting before the program even began. Some guy's out there painting. It's wonderful who he was. So I met him. He was the Hallmark greeting cards painter for about 25 years. <laughs> but he paints five paintings like this a day. A day. Carol Gable grew up on a ranch in South Dakota. No formal training whatsoever. She won the uh, Finger Lakes Plain Air Contest. She's a brilliant painter. Thanks. Derwood Coffey. Those of you who are in the Art League know him well because he's taught some of our classes for us. He's from Garden City. And he was a graphic artist, probably for Chrysler, for a number of years. Next. He also was a Marine in the sixth degree black belt. So if you didn't like his painting, you never told him. <laughs> Okay, Michelle Bird. I painted with her in the Adirondacks. She's uh, from originally from uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. She now lives in Taos, New Mexico. And uh, she's a brilliant painter, and you can find her on Facebook. She's really good. Jimmy Tidwell, who's from Monroe? Jimmy Tidwell is a famous Monroe painter. <laughs> to us, he's very famous, because he's, he's our plein air painter. If you've ever been to a jazz festival in Monroe, you saw the guy who's standing there doing the paintings, but Jimmy Tidwell. He's, he's not here right now. No. And Gary Bertram is from Covington, Kentucky. And he was, uh, he was a graphic artist for some uh, company down in Kentucky. He's also a concert guitarist. He plays with the uh, Cincinnati uh, Orchestra. And he's played at the Grand Ole Opry several times. Next. Rick Wilson. Rick Wilson is the official painter of the uh, Indiana State Parks. He's painted every single one of them. And they're on his, uh, he has a uh, calendar out of all their artwork. And he's uh, also one of ours. Next. This is one day of painting at the Adirondack. One day. When they first started in 2011, there were 15 known paintings of the Adirondacks. At the end of the year, there were 800. And since that time, every year, they've had another 800 to 1,200 paintings. So now there are thousands of paintings of the Adirondacks, all started by Plein Air Magazine. And these are the following artists and signatories for Robert Selden Duncanson Day. You see the major museums. We have Mr. Salvador Pons, Director of Victoria Institute of Arts, Charles Wright Museum, Jennifer Evans, and you list down uh, that. Got it? Okay, yeah, that's it. Anything else? This is Robert Sullivan Society. Bob Williams Hall, Vice President. And you can read who they are. Um, but anyhow, that's basically Robert Sullivan Douglas. If you know anything about him now, I hope you know a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. And for those who don't know, Pat is an accomplished artist in his own right. So he also paints. Now, next up is a young lady that I met for the first time today. I'd heard about her because she is famous. Um, famous, not infamous. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's Dora Kelly. Dora. <laughs> Dora is the originator of the movement leading to the placement of a cemetery monument honoring Robert S. Duncanson here in Monroe. None of us didn't know about this. And way before Pat or any of us got involved in any of this, it was Dora leading the charge. Yes. And she's the one who introduced the Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club to the idea of supporting her efforts to recognize Duncanson's contribution to art worldwide. And she is co-chairperson co of this event tonight. Laura, over to you. Duncanson's legacy will bring him into our own personal thoughts, hearts, and souls. 
If he were here, I would thank him for this experience of coming to know all about his meaningful life in those turbulent times and all his tremendous works of art. Let me tell you about what led up to procuring the headstone for Rabbi S. Duncanson's unmarked grave. In 2017, I attended a presentation at the Monroe Historical Museum. Val Mercer, the curator of the African American Art Department at the DIA, gave the presentation. She did a wonderful job. And I enjoyed it so much hearing all about Robert Selden Duncanson. At the end of the event, Val informed us that Salvador Salo Pons, director of the DIA, and his wife, Alex May, were very interested to find his unmarked grave, believed to be here in Monroe. I was surprised and disturbed at the same time by this, that such a great man and artist would have an unmarked grave. So I felt compelled to help and embarked on a journey to find the gravesite. I told Val I would try to find him. Before I left, one of the attendees, Mr. Dan Greschuk, came up to me and said I should go to a Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club meeting, and they likely would help me in this endeavor. So, I set out to find Mr. Duncanson's gravesite, asking many, 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 many questions, <laughs> and doing some online research. I found out he was buried at the historical Woodland Cemetery, Monroe. I found the exact location of his unmarked grave with the help of Mr. Henry Huggins, who is in charge of the Woodland Cemetery. So, I then designed this headstone, and I went to Leo LeClaire of LeClaire Monuments Company, who was highly recommended, and he gave me a wonderful price estimate, much less than its market value to be made from beautiful Indian black marble granites, as I remembered it was described to me. So therefore, I attended the next Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club meeting, and I discussed my project with Henry Harper and Harold Branks III, the co-founders of the DFABC, Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. And they were very enthusiastic they made an announcement and arranged for an auction of art to raise money for the headstone. An acclaimed artist in the club, Mr. Henry Heading, donated art to be auctioned. And then there were some other items auctioned as well, and enough was raised to procure the headstone. So then we paid. <laughs> so we paid for the headstone. And when it was finished, the DIA said they wanted to display it. And they had it in the room with Duncanson's paintings for several months. It was beautiful. And it was then finally placed on the unmarked grave of Robert S. Duncanson by Mr. LeClaire. Lastly, I would like to say this has been a wonderful journey for me to experience. One that simply worked out to write the right, to make it right the obvious historical wrong. Y'all get that one? <laughs> that took place where Mr. Duncanson had been placed in an unmarked grave. That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I have mentioned so much about the Breakfast Club, Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. I have one of the co-founders here, Mr. Henry Harper, and I would love to connect with him. Tell us about Breakfast Club. It's an honor. It's an honor. Um, I prepared a speech, but I forgot my glasses, so a little short message. So I would like to thank the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> And I see Reggie Singleton, who's coming, who's doing very well. He's uh, been a painter around town for a while, but he came to Breakfast Club and we got him out there. He's doing shows, exhibitions, getting in private collections. Uh, Dahu Shabazz, just phenomenal. Just, you painting him, what up? So, and, and selling, so, and I tell people all the time, when you do Facebook, and it's one of the secrets I tell, so I'll tell you now, in case there's some artists amongst you, is post as much as possible 
as artists earn street creds, because street creds is what gives you value. You can say you want $10,000 all day long, but whose collection do you have? Where have you sold your work at? Where have you placed your things? Those kind of things are the street creds, and you must write that stuff down and correct your collectors down and those kind of things, because all of it is just pen and paper. So you get value. Dora kicking butt. She is really, really doing very, very well as an artist. And so I won't take up much of your time, but the thing is we will train, uh, train, we encourage artists to practice their craft, practice their profession, practice what they do, and really get out there and put your feet And he teaches art. And he, he taught art full time in the school system, as Walter Bailey. Next to him is Isaiah Ford. He's come a long way. And he's doing, doing very, very, very well. Stand up. And just, you know, wave. And, you know, wave. and then I did something else that hadn't been done before. Jeff Koons is a famous American artist. Jeff Koons has almost a billion, a billion dollars, actually about $700 million worth of art. And you know how he got it? He traded with other artists and accumulated wealth through art. Picasso was living. He traded with him. He traded with Andy Warhol. He, he has a real organized art collection. And so, because of that, we grew collectors. And then people would come to the breakfast club. It got so big, I would allow them to show two pieces, two minutes, because people would love to talk about themselves. And, uh, well, not me. <laughs> if I am talking about breakfast club, then third person. Okay. Is, is all you following? Okay. Pat, we live on your corny jokes. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we talking the business of art, and, and I'm so very, very happy. And we just had a huge show that Carol Cook Reed put together for the Plowshare show, uh, the Plowshare, Swords of the Plowshare, downtown Detroit in Midtown, and it was an enormously successful show, enormously successful. She was so generous that she gave all the money to the artist and then made it made him feel guilty so we don't make back to the other one. <laughs> so uh, that's it. Um, we got I hate to I shouldn't announce this but we'll get myself in trouble because we got a sign in there. So breakfast so when we go back to meeting publicly, uh, or publicly because we haven't done that yet, um, we are going to be in a new location and it's going to be I'm not being done. It's going to be huge. <laughs> yes, it's going to be, it's going to be really good. Oh, close. Oh, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. Yes, she's an amazing thing. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, you girls been up to trouble, huh? Okay, all right. So thank you very much, Nora. We have about maybe 3,000 members, about 600 practicing artists, and it's a really big art. Group. And uh, we do a lot of shows, displays. We like to do something right here at campus too. And uh, just keep that in mind. Yes, sir. I ain't joking. I ain't joking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one thing he didn't mention, I thought he would. We are a family. We are a, a, a what would you say? Help me here. We are a nest of photos. Yeah. <laughs> that everybody. Promote. It's not, it's not just our group page stuff, which is it, but they're networking and, and, and Every reminding day. And, and teaching and, and, and everything. And there's so much to learn, of course, mm -hmm. in art. And we get inspired by each other. We want copies of people like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's wonderful. And this is something that's a blessing to us if anybody wanted to come. I don't even hesitate. So to, to show up two times, you remember, uh, when we open back up, or like us on Facebook. There's a lot of information. The shows, exhibitions all over the country, all over the world. We post them. We want people to participate and get your work out there and become artists. At one time, they, when kids were becoming artists, they didn't want your parents, they want you to become an artist. But now, everything has changed. You know, who gets a gold watch anymore from working at Chrysler? It just doesn't happen. So become our entrepreneurs, inspire the kids, Inspire the grandkids. There is a business to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Harper. You know, I had never heard that expression until today. Entrepreneur. 
Entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, I love it. As an educator, you know, I, I, I think about what we do, what we do at a college like ours, and we educate. But education is not simply for the sake of education, it's so they can go out there and do what? Earn, get a job and earn an income for them, their families, and to hopefully transform their communities. So education is not simply for the sake of education, and art, hopefully, is not just for the case. I mean, you may enjoy this, but hopefully you can go out there and make it a business and earn income for yourself, your family, as you can transform the community. So I move on, and, I, and I'm honored to be in the, in the presence of all these artists today. So I, I want to move on to introduce one of those wonderful artists. A couple of them are going to come up. These phenomenal artists. The first one, Walter Bailey, where are you? There he is, the man, the legend. <laughs> I've seen the man on TV. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Bailey focuses his art on new innovations in conceptual design. During the 1960s Cultural Revolution, really, you've been around for that long, uh, he began to define a unique style, a black expressionist art medium. By 1977, he developed a revolutionary reverse art technique, fusing color to a smooth acrylic polymer panel known as acrylic fusion arts medium, his signature art form of discipline stylizations, pioneering two and three dimensional genres. Uh, he, he followed the artist's creed to experiment with new mediums and explore his infinite craft. He followed new dimensions and, and, and creating a continuum. Change and change the artist to the innovator. His artistic achievements, awards, ex exhibitions, and public art installations include two book covers. Hmm. The Bombay Sapphire 2014 finalist, Charles H. Wright's 2008 Legacy Award, and the 2019 International International Institutes of Metropolitan Detroit Award for Art and History. Today, he seeks to pass art-like experiences to emerging next-gen visionary artists. Okay, so you and you, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So with that introduction, I'd like Mr. Bailey to come forward and do his thing. Well, put this on, but that's not. What I'm doing. Good evening, everyone. This is going to be a fun evening. I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I do want to give some enjoyment. I'd like to thank Dora. I'd like to thank Tricia. I'd like to thank the, the Robert Selden Duncanson Society for inviting me here. I'd like to thank the Fine Arts Breakfast Club, and I would like to thank God for my creative talent and my wise use of it. The artist must use his talent wisely. I'm here to talk about what it means, the ins and outs of being a black artist in America today. I find that the best way to give it to you is my own story. Black art has its beginnings in the ancient African early ancestors. Small societies came together and formed villages. Villages became civil states as they expanded and on into great nation states. Amongst these early ancestors were two or three who had shown some kind of ability to create images from the world around them. These individuals became revered in early African society 
They were the first inventors to go from using clays and vegetation to create pigments. And, and from this early inventory atmosphere, art grew. It grew along corridors of time. The African American artist, or black art, has to be divided into two sections. One is the artist. The other is the black artist. One has its influence from European experiences, and the other is from African experiences. There are three timelines that affect the African American artist today. At least it affects me. Now, for all of you artists in the room, raise your hands, please. Are there any artists in this building and in this room? Raise your hand. Come on, come on now. What's the matter with you? <laughs> now, this is the energy in the room. It's called creative energy. It's flowing in and out of this room. It's flowing into each one of you. There is a power in the universe called creative force. And those early African artists were revered because they shone creative force. Now, as we go along the timeline of the African civilizations, a couple of hundred thousand years of expression, again, the three timelines, African timeline, the European timeline, and the American timeline. These three timelines affect African American artists. If you understand history and you collect the African experiences from early African ancestors, early painters on rock walls and on cave walls, these early Africans' artwork is still there after hundreds of thousands of years of rain and sand. They're still there. So whatever, whatever chemicals, somebody ought to do a uh, research project on what is the chemical makeup of these designs, of the paint they used. So we have the early African artists to the European experience. Now, Europe becomes the center of art. Africa was once the center of art. The Benin, bronze statues, the Chihuahua statues, the Bambara art, South Africa. Africa was alive as a civilization, but it had its time. Europe became the center of civilization. Now, this is when art changed for black artists. Because now we left, we left smelting gold and silver and bronze. And the, the, the European experience after the Middle Passage, after the Middle Passage, changed from ebony wood statues and bronze statues to canvas and paper. As we came into the Americas, under slavery, the, the African artist, and there, there needs to be even a, 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 uh, 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 some research on what happened to African art after slaves were removed from the continent. What kind of art was continuing to be produced during this slavery period? the Middle Passage, the intrusion into African greatness. And so, as the history of black art moves from the African continent to the European continent and up to modern times, we have Cubism and Impressionism and Expressionism. We have art that has changed. And this art that has changed is now affecting the African-American artist, because we don't carve anymore. We paint. Now, as, our, as Africans 
left through the Middle Passage and came to the Americas, now we have another timeline that affects black art and black artists. This young man, <laughs> they, they got me. I, 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 thought, I thought it was Brother Robert. Uh, but I have a, an affinity for him because this is where my story begins. My story begins Walter Bailey, that's the name I was born with, 1948 Dublin, Georgia. During the 1960s Black Revolution, I received the name Brother Rapp because I talk a lot. Revolution. <laughs> I received the name Brother Rap. During the 1980s, I received my African name, Atin Antami, which means man of destiny. And I began my art career third grade, Mary Weinstein. Never forget her, never forget her face. She called my family in, mother, father, grandmother, and said, he is an artist, and you need to follow up with him. And friends, family, and schools came together and put me into a special program through junior high school and high school. I was an, a recognized land and seascape artist. I was from Connecticut. The Connecticut countryside and seashore just, it, it overpowered me. I was an oil painter, loved it. But time moves on and experiences move on. At the, my second year, it changed from the landscapes of Connecticut, the back roads of Hartford, Windsor, and other aspects. My uncle used to take, go down to the seashore every Thursday and get his fish right off the fishing boat. He used to take me because he knew I loved the seascapes. He knew I loved the ocean. Question? Yes. Uh, do you do all of this freehand, or are there techniques that you use to divide off lines with a particular, because your lines are tight. <laughs> They're really good. Yeah. Uh, uh, very quickly. My, my life experience, or art life experience, is divided into 12 different transitions. Mm -hmm. One of my transitions, uh, right before um, my black expressionist uh, experience, mm -hmm. uh, I was having a really hard time with doing lines, and how to, how sure. to keep the line perfect. And my, my high school instructor, Mr. Ellis, said to me, he said, if you want to control your lines, do everything in black and white. So for four years, I did everything I did was in black and white. And pen and ink. I don't even think they used to get ink anymore. So you could just see the, the difference, like the clear difference. Yeah, yeah. Once 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 I was able to control using a pen, brush, and India ink, once I was able to control my lines, it came back when I developed the um, fusion techniques. So my lines are now crystal clear. Yeah, they're amazing. You're here to it's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. I was very reluctant to try to get him off stage here. <laughs> lessons in history, right? Lessons in art, lessons in history. I guess phenomenal. Thank you. On to the next artist. Darren Darby. As self-taught figurative artist, Mr. Darby's passion is to create artworks that spark meaningful conversations. Over the years, he has created art using graphite pencils, colored pencils, pastels, acrylic paint. However, in 2014, there involved an innovative art process he called Le Puzzle. Le Puzzle. All right, I couldn't even pronounce it. Um, Layered Puzzled Image. Lay puzzle art is created by cutting textured, textured cardstock paper, mat board, or wood. Each individual color of the art piece is cut out by hand, layered, and puzzled together to create an image using negative space. Hmm. 
His artwork is inspired by events that took place during his childhood, biblical themes, thought-provoking messages, and uncredited historical black figures. The purpose of his art is to express love, serving as a visual reminder of one's self-worth, and reminding us of our personal history. So, with that now, I will introduce Mr. Alf and Mr. Darby to come to this podium and tell you about it. Well, Mr. Bailey's um, act is tough to follow. So. <laughs> but first of all, I was always taught to give honor to honor is due. So I would like to give um, honor to the, the Robert S. Duncan Society right now, to um, Dora and Mr. Charles Kelly and um, Patricia Baker. And I can't not leave out the Detroit Fire Arts Breakfast Club. Because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here today. I mean, my, my mentor is actually Mr. Henry Harper. I call him my bad uncle. My good, my good uncle couldn't make it. So, with that, what stood out to me with um, Robert S. Duncanson is that he was a self-taught artist, like myself. And he was the first African-American international artist. So, that let me know that there is opportunity for us, those that come behind him, to have an opportunity for the world to see your artwork. I mean, some of us have so much aspiration to be out there and to be seen because we want to share our gift. We all have a gift and someone's out there looking for your gift. And I know that my gift can be used. I took it for granted as a child or as a young adult because I didn't see the value in my art because it came so easy to me. So once I connected with the Breakfast Club, they introduced the business side of the art to me. And like I said, I was an artist all my life. And then I asked God to give me something new, something different. I don't want to be like everybody else because I can draw, I can paint, I can do all those things, but there was a thousand people that can do the same thing. So he gave me the puzzle, which is layered puzzle, which I had no idea what to see. I end up inventing a name because that's what the process is. So here I am today before you all because of the Detroit Fire and Arts Breakfast Club. And and this has awarded me a number of different opportunities all over the country. I mean, I can't give them all the credit. I do the hard work, too. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is truly an honor and a privilege to be for all of you because all of you have a gift. And someone's out there looking for your gift. I see everything as an art. We look at cooking. It's an art. Repairing vehicles. It's an art. Hairdressers. It's an art. Hair cutter. It's an art. Clothing. It's an art. <laughs> so we are all artists in this room. So I leave you with this. I challenge you all to go out there and find what your art is because somebody's out there looking for you. I'm not as long-winded as, as, as Mr. Bailey, so I don't, I don't have a whole lot to say. I, I just love encouraging others to, to get in their lane and understand their purpose. So thank you. I hope you all enjoy the show. Thank you to, to, to Dora, especially because she was on my head about this. <laughs> Kathy Williams. 
So I've become an, uh, 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 an African American historian since I, I, I started doing this artwork, this process, because I wanted to give credit to all the unsung heroes that people don't know. So Kathleen Williams was a person I did not know. So once I did some research, I understood who she was, and that made me even more excited about it, so I had to share it with others so that they could know who she is. Even though I'm not present to tell the story, go Google her name, all her instrument, Google it. I mean, life is so easy right now, you can Google anything and find out. <laughs> yes, sir. Two stars. Who can see Darren's work in person? Oh, no, you you and that. I'm just, I used to see Darren's work in person. It was quite different than what you see on the screen. Because all those shadows are layered uh, and cut out by hand. The work is absolutely amazing. It's on point. The scale is good. It's just wonderful. Hey, Darren, you just sold a piece to the Henry Ford. No, the series, the Henry Ford. Oh, sister? Yes. Uh, you want to share that a little bit? Oh, it was a commission piece. Um, it's basically to give honor to all the men and women who served during the COVID years. And um, they asked me just to put, put together uh, some ideas. And I created these, um, actually, five different pieces that incorporated 20 different people. And they were all cut out by hand. show my face because I don't want you to say, oh, you're just so arrogant. You know? yeah. <laughs> That's not the case. All right. You know, this is Sydney Portier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Stacy's art. 
and he will have a chance perhaps to speak and to be a part of the local show that we will be doing on April 19th, as Patrick mentioned this earlier, right? April 19th, uh, to honor Robert S. Duncanson again at Monroe County Community College, and it will focus on history, art, the literary influences of Robert S. Duncanson and local Monroe artists of all ages. So it's going to be a uh, of all ages, and, and Pat and a few other people are putting that together. It will be at Monroe County Community College, and that's separate and apart from anything else that we may follow up with, you know, in terms of us working with the Breakfast Art Club, uh, the Breakfast Club. I don't know which comes first, Breakfast or Art. <laughs> all right. Once I got that breakfast in my head, I just couldn't get it. But it needs to be in the morning. That's all it means, right? Oh, oh so you're not... But initially, breakfast was because she met in the morning. All right. But with that said, um, the program is almost over. And so I will at this point, oh, yes, introduce, uh, yes, uh, Dor Dora's coming back up. And then after Dora comes up, then we'll come, um, uh, um, Sandy Vanessa, going to finish, finish this off, right? Sandy. I just, we had a late arrival but I do want to point out and let you meet him. Wonderful Nathan Spratt. And he's right over here. He's got some so uh, once Dora comes, then I will have a couple of thanks, a few thank yous from uh, the NAACP and a few others. So Dora, come on up. Sandy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Sandy. Was well, this a wonderful show or what? <laughs> I'm very inspired by all of you. Um, I have been an artist for many years and uh, been the president of Monroe Art League for five years in a row right now. And we are an art league, local art league, that has been around for 62 years. I would love for them to get more of Robert Selden Duncanson. I am proud to be a charter member with the founder, Patrick Garley. So I, I really don't even know what to say, but I am inspired. I'm sure all of us that are artists, um, Darren is right. We're all artists in some respect, and I've always said, that you can be an artist. A stick figure is a form of art. You have something to build on, and it makes you so happy. History, Walter, talking about history. If you study something and your passion is there, you can be an artist for that passion. So take it to heart and Thank everybody that came. Do you have some things you want to give out? Um, we're going to have a few uh, final words from our president. And then we are going to join us for our reception in the education room. The artists who have pieces there will be there to answer questions for you. And Stacy will be there also. He hasn't got a chance to talk, but he will be there to answer questions. So please stay. We're going to have more fun tonight. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to tell you about the videos also. Um, Doris, friends, and Pat Baker, uh, the speakers that have been here, the artists that are here, have made videos for us. Am I right? Okay, and you're going to have the opportunity to view those in your time tonight. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. So just uh, two more thank yous, and then we can then proceed to view the art and partake of the meal. There. So, I'd like to say that thank you to the sponsors, Lazy Boy Corporation. Lazy Boy Incorporated. Anybody representing Lazy Boy in here? Raise your hand. All right. The Rotary Club of Monroe, Rotarians in the house. 
NAACP Branch 3164, NAACP Members Club. The Barley family, Barley family in the house. Uh, Agua Dolce, Agua Dolce, one of our sponsors. No. The Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. And of course, to all the artists, all the artists that can, please, the artists stand up from Detroit. I, I want to see the Detroit artists stand up again. I don't remember all the artists. Thank you, thank you for following the group. And uh, Henry, thank you for creating entrepreneurs. All right, and hopefully we'll have some entrepreneurs here in our, in our community. Um, a special thank you to our presenters, Darren Darby and Walter Bailey. And of course, Henry Harper for your presence here today. And to all of you, all of you for coming this evening. We can still mingle a bit out there. You know, keep your mask on, I guess, and social distance. <laughs> It's a, it's a different world, but um, let's see. Also, Stacy, Stacy Hall, and special thanks to um, Dora Kelly and Chip, Patrick, Raleigh, Sandy Banasaka, Jeff, 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 Jeff. I'd be remiss if I miss Jeff, I'll, I'll break it. Jeff, he's also the first to see all the the brochures and the flyers that you see, right, Jeff? And all of this, Jeff Albrego. And Scott, for the use of the, uh, Scott and the River Raisin Battlefield Foundation for the use of this facility, Scott. Uh, I don't know if he's still up there or not. And uh, Zay Turnage, owner, Zay, they serve as a food. Uh, Turnage, owner of a chosen few. And that's, uh, he's a black entrepreneur. And, uh, that said, once again, thank you all for coming this evening. Great event, wasn't it? Let's give everyone a round of applause. Oh, yeah, there's, some, there's some awards or something to be handed out. So I'll let Pat finish this off. You're not going to hear from me anymore. I'm going to hear from